Hey everyone, this is part two in the vitamin D deficiency series. So in the last lesson we talked about the sources of vitamin D, why we need vitamin D, the absorption and metabolism of vitamin D, and finally a category of causes of vitamin D. This lesson we're going to focus on clinical features of vitamin D, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. And before we get into the clinical features of vitamin D deficiency, it's important to note that a majority of patients with vitamin D deficiency are asymptomatic. They don't experience any acute symptoms. Now I say that specifically acute symptoms as we will see there can be some chronic findings later but for the most part the majority of patients with vitamin D deficiency don't experience any acute symptoms and if they are symptomatic a lot of it has to do with issues with low calcium levels so hypocalcemia low calcium levels in the blood and in some cases we may see signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia including perioral tingling so a tingling sensation around the mouth Chavostek sign, which occurs when the facial nerve is continuously tapped and the facial nerve doesn't relax properly. And another sign we could see with hypocalcemia is Trousseau sign, which occurs when a blood pressure cuff is inflated on someone's arm and that patient has a carpal pedal spasm. So if you want more information on those signs and symptoms, please check out my lessons on those topics. But for the most part, we're going to talk about what happens after hypocalcemia. So what happens is that a hypocalcemic state leads to an upregulation of the activity of the parathyroid glands, leading to a secondary hyperparathyroidism. So because there's not enough vitamin D or calcitriol around to absorb calcium from the gastrointestinal system, we get low levels of calcium. And calcium actually prevents the release of parathyroid hormone. So if we have low levels of calcium, this can lead to an upregulation of parathyroid hormone release. And this is secondary hyperparathyroidism. So again, this is an entire other topic for another lesson. I'm just briefly talking about it here. Secondary hyperparathyroidism, this increase in parathyroid hormone leads to the reabsorption of calcium and phosphate from the bone. That is what parathyroid hormone does. It also does other functions on the kidneys as well. But right now we're just going to focus on the bone. So it helps to dissolve bone and release calcium and phosphate. So because the body is low in calcium, parathyroid hormone goes to the bone and releases calcium from the bone. So you get bone reabsorption. But what this does is it causes bone pain, can cause myalgias, so muscle aches, can lead to arthralgias, so joint aches, can cause fasciculation, so muscle twitching, and it can cause weakness. So again, this is a very brief overview of hyperparathyroidism. I'll have another lesson in the future on this topic specifically. Some other clinical features have to do with bone development and maintenance. So we talked about hyperparathyroidism causing bone resorption. Well, that can cause problems. We can get osteomalacia, so softening of bone. We can see this in children and adults. If there's vitamin D deficiency in children, where they're not able to actually develop and form their bones properly, we can get rickets. And this again occurs in children. And these topics by themselves are complex and require their own lessons. So I'll talk about these topics in future lessons. And overall, because we're getting a lot of bone resorption, we get decreased bone mineralization. And that can cause other problems as well. These include osteopenia and osteoporosis. So here is osteoporosis. We see a normal bone and then we see it becoming very parotic. So it becomes weaker and there's an increased risk of fractures. So there's increased risk of falls and increased risk of fractures. And oftentimes these findings can be evidence for chronic subclinical vitamin D deficiency. So subclinical vitamin D deficiency really means that they have vitamin D deficiency and they could be having it for a long time, but they're not really having acute symptoms from it. But all the while their bones are kind of getting weaker, they're having decreased bone mineralization, and then eventually they end up having issues with bone health. So again, can be evidence that there's been some chronic ongoing subclinical vitamin D deficiency. And some other clinical features of vitamin D deficiency include immunological dysregulation. So it's been shown that vitamin D deficiency is associated with an increased risk of various infectious diseases. And in particular, acute respiratory tract infections seem to occur more frequently in those with vitamin D deficiency. Now, I won't talk about all the details here in this slide, but if you want more information, please check out my lesson on the topic of vitamin D deficiency and the immune system. But nonetheless, it has been shown that patients who are vitamin D deficient are at an increased risk of certain infectious diseases. One of those is tuberculosis, another one is influenza, and another one is bacterial vaginosis. So these are some of the infections that patients can be at an increased risk for if they have vitamin D deficiency. 
and some other clinical features of vitamin D deficiency can occur in children, and these include developmental delay, lethargy, and irritability. And then there's increasing evidence that vitamin D deficiency is associated with an increased risk of depression, obesity, and diabetes, heart disease, and some types of cancer. So there's a lot of research to be done with regards to vitamin D deficiency and some of these other conditions as well. So we do see that there's evidence for an association between vitamin D deficiency and an increased risk of depression, obesity and diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. So as you can see, vitamin D deficiency is associated with many different conditions, and each of these conditions requires its own topic of discussion. So in future lessons, I'm going to delve into each of these conditions with regards to vitamin D deficiency. So how is vitamin D deficiency diagnosed? Vitamin D deficiency is diagnosed by looking at 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels. So we're going to talk about what the cutoffs are for the diagnosis. Clinicians can also look at parathyroid levels to assess for secondary hyperparathyroidism as well. So the levels for diagnosing vitamin D deficiency are the following. And there is some debate as to the optimum levels of vitamin D, but these are the numbers that have been stated. So mild deficiency of vitamin D is when 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels are less than 20 or less than 30. Some sources say 30 nanograms per milliliter. Moderate deficiency is when 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels are less than 10 nanograms per milliliter. And severe deficiency is when 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels are less than five nanograms per milliliter. So these are the numbers that classify mild, moderate, and severe vitamin D deficiency. So how is vitamin D deficiency treated? So it's all about replacing vitamin D. But you might be asking which one should be used, vitamin D3 or vitamin D2? So vitamin D3 has actually been shown to replete levels of vitamin D quicker than vitamin D2. So vitamin D3 is most often used. And the amount of supplementation of vitamin D differs depending on age and risk factors. So we're gonna briefly talk about this, but it is a very complicated topic and I suggest checking out that reference in the description below. Before I get into how much to give to replete vitamin D levels, once levels are normal, the maintenance dose in patients who are considered lower risk, and I'll talk about this a little bit more here as well, is 1,000 to 2,000 international units per day. So we talked about minimum levels before of about 800, but if an individual has had vitamin D deficiency, and there's really no other risk factors that we can see or note usually the maintenance dose is 1,000 to 2,000 international units per day. And I mentioned this with regards to lower risk individuals because the maintenance dose is likely higher in high risk individuals. So these maintenance doses can be as high as 3,000 to 4,000 international units per day for individuals who are particularly at higher risk. And some of these individuals can include darker skin individuals and people that are overweight or obese. When an individual is deficient, if they have a vitamin D deficiency, Oftentimes, it is stated that 6,000 international units per day be given for eight weeks, followed by a maintenance dose once vitamin D levels reach normal levels of at least 30 nanograms per milliliter. So 6,000 international units per day for eight weeks, and then once vitamin D levels have been reached to normal levels, the maintenance dose. So again, maintenance dose differs between lower risk and higher risk individuals. And then you might find that in some cases, of high-risk individuals who are deficient, they may need even higher levels for a shorter period of time too. So again, very complicated topic. And there's some special circumstances if vitamin D deficiency has led to severe hypocalcemia where patients are having symptoms of hypocalcemia, IV calcium is given. If there's severe osteopenia or osteoporosis, bisphosphonates are also given. And in patients who have liver disease or issues actually metabolizing fat, calcidiol is given. So 25 hydroxy vitamin D, not ergocalciferol or cholecalciferol, because they might not be able to add that first hydroxyl group in the liver, or they might not be able to absorb it at all. So calcidiol is given for those with liver disease or issues with fat metabolism. And if there's persistent issues with vitamin D deficiency, even after giving supplementation, calcitriol is often given. So it, you essentially bypass those two modification steps in the liver and in the kidneys. So calcitriol is the one that is given if there is essentially refractory vitamin D deficiency. So again, 
This was a very complicated topic. It's very complicated to go through. I hope you found this lesson helpful and informative. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell. It helps support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.